Um, David, I think it's okay to go ahead and record if we're not already. Um, I do want to remind folks we're recording. Again, for anyone who's joined um, after I announce this, we will be posting the recording of this discussion today on our websites uh, through the YouTube channel. And we'll also be posting the slides from this and distributing them to anyone who signed up as a registrant. Um, <clears throat> I, I do want to just mention that um, we have the mics muted at this time, but we'll open them up for conversation after the data discussion. So welcome everyone. And Rachel, if you'll advance to the next slide, thank you. Okay, so um, the SEOW stands for the State Epidemiological Outcomes Work Group. And funding for the SEOW has been provided from the Delaware Department of Health and Social Services, the Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health, or DSAM, through the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration federally. Um, the SEOW is facilitated uh, at the University of Delaware by the Center for Drug and Health Studies. And we posted our website a little bit later. I'm going to pop a number of uh, of links into the chat, including the website for the SEOW and the products that we're gonna be discussing today. Next slide. So the overarching goal or the mission of the SEOW is to bring data to the forefront of prevention efforts. Um, the SEOW has been around for about 13 or 14 years um, here in Delaware and it grew out of the Strategic Prevention Framework um, initiative at, at SAMHSA. There are four main goals for the SEOW. The first is to identify, analyze, and share data. The second is to create data products, and that includes the EPI profile that we'll be talking about today. But it also includes infographics, <clears throat> excuse me, gap, gap reports, um, Venn diagrams, for example, of shared risk factors and so on. There are policy papers um, and other products, including heat maps that we post online. And all of these materials are free for downloading and electronically sharing. <clears throat> sharing for anyone who has an interest in the data. The third goal is to train stakeholders in being able to use and understand the data, and that's something we'll be discussing today, of course. And then um, the final goal is to build state and local level monitoring systems in order to ensure that we have a strong data infrastructure that supports prevention efforts here in the state. And we do this by maintaining a network of stakeholders to provide um, input into the kinds of activities we conduct here at the SEOW and also to inform some of the data products we develop. We also rely on that network to help support the data collection and promoting uh, the availability of the data and helping in dissemination. Currently, we have about 115 members in the SEOW network. Um, these are folks from state agencies, community organizations, uh, institutions of higher education, um, folks that are interested just at a grassroots level, um, folks working in the community. It, it cuts across disciplines and it cuts across sectors. And if you're currently not involved in the SEOW but would like to be, I want you to let us know and we would be happy to connect you with all of this information. Next slide, Rachel. So today we're gonna to be talking about the epidemiological profile. We refer to this as the EPI. Um, this is an annual report of data and uh, it highlights the trends and patterns around substance use, mental health, risk factors, protective factors, and then we also address special topics. It is by far our most comprehensive product. It involves um, drawing on a number of data sources to present a picture, if you will, of what's happening in the state of Delaware. Um, the EPI report can be used for a number of reasons. Uh, you can use it to support a needs assessment. Many folks draw on it to look at um, what they're doing with grant applications when they want to cite data for expressing a problem statement. The data is used to help in evaluation planning and strategies, and then it's used for presentations and other forms of public outreach and awareness. Um, some of you folks have been um, introducing yourselves in the chat. 
uh, I, I'd be curious to hear later a little bit more about how you've used this information for your initiatives. Um, Rachel? So I mentioned that we are looking at a number of data sources when we compile the EPI report. For the 2020 report, we've actually drawn on about 30 data sources. So you can see on the left hand side of the screen, these are a number of the resources that we drew upon to actually incorporate uh, figures and tables and charts. And these would include things like, you know, the annual traffic fatality reports, um, things from the Delaware School Survey, the Youth Tobacco Survey, the Youth, the youth Risk Behavior Survey, the Behavioral uh, Risk Factor Surveillance System, and other standing um, forms of data that are collected in Delaware. If you look on the right side of that chart, it'll show you the most recent year of data. So you can see that we've incorporated data from 2018 and 2019 into this most current report, which we just posted a few months ago. On the right hand side of the screen are other data sources that we drew upon to help flesh out the context around these particular data elements. Um, they would include things like the Census Bureau or America's Health Ranking, labor statistics, etc. cetera. Um, I, I also wanna mention here that when we, uh, we not only post data products, but part of what we do at the SEOW is to try to connect folks to other data resources. So we maintain a number of data resource pages on the website at the Center for Drug and Health Studies. Um, you can access again, all of these things in, and link out to some other websites that would be of interest. Next, next slide, Rachel. So one thing we do when we post the EPI is we put it up as an entire report. It is, it is a lengthy report. Uh, as I said, there are about 200 different figures and tables. It's broken into chapters and Rachel's going to talk about the structure of the report. So we do post it as something you can download as, as a whole, but we also include it as a chapter by chapter format. So you don't have to download the entire thing. You can go directly to the, to the um, the source of the material that you're most interested in. And we also have included an epi infographic series as well, where we take some of the key highlights, such as this one that I've got up on the screen. This is the one on the tobacco and vaping in Delaware chapter. And we pull out those key elements. And so we create some sort of an infographic that you can use at a glance to refer to different things to hand out to your constituents or to use in any other way that you think is appropriate. One other thing that we do with the EPI report is we go ahead and we create, and this is based upon the recommendation of one of our stakeholders, uh, Mr. Uh, I think Dr. David, Dr. Lynch, Dr. Bill Lynch, because we have several, um, and he has always used these, um, these resources in his presentations and found that they were much easier to do if we created them and posted them in a slide deck. So one of the projects that we work on after we post the initial report is to convert those to slides so that you're free to use those and just slide them into your presentations. That will be coming soon. Um, so, so this is the, a little bit of background about the SEOW, about the EPI in particular, but I do want to mention that the EPI and all of the SEOW activities are very collaborative in nature. We have, um, today it's just, you know, Rachel and I talking and David here, but we have a number of folks at the center. The project is led by Dr. Laura Rapp, um, MJ Scales, who is uh, a certified prevention specialist at the center and does a great deal of work in community um, outreach, is uh, the co-PI on the project. We have a number of folks who are working on the survey team who participate, administrators who are actually going out and collecting data who participate. We have folks who are working on health and mental health projects and cr criminal justice projects. These are the folks at the center who contribute to the SEOW. But beyond that, we also do have a number of folks, as I mentioned in our broader network, who are contributing to the EPI as well, both in terms of informing its process, giving us data analysis. I, I'd like to just give an acknowledgement to two folks who contributed this year, uh, Jen Donahue at the Office of the Child Advocate who provided data on the substance exposed infants. Uh, chapter and also Dr. Khalil Husseini at the CDC and the Division of Public Health who provided information and analysis from the National Survey on Children's Health on the ACEs chapter in the report. So you can see it's a very collaborative effort. Um, and I just wanted to recognize that, um, that a lot of folks 
uh, put forth a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to create this particular report. But the person who has actually uh, shepherded, if you will, and led the data analysis for the EPI report in the past several years is Rachel Riding. She is a graduate research assistant and a doctoral candidate at the University of Delaware who's worked with us for a number of years. And she has um, done a great deal of work, not only with the EPI report, but with the actual data collection efforts we've done for the Delaware School Survey and the Youth Tobacco Survey and the Youth Risk Behavior Survey here at the center. And she's very familiar with these data sets and has presented on them at national and state conferences in the past. So, date, so I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel now, who's going to talk about um, the deeper dive, the a little bit more specific about the report and share some of the highlights from each of the chapters. So Rachel, I'll turn it over to you. And then after that, we'll open up the mics and have a discussion about the data itself. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sharon. Um, so, so yeah, what we're gonna do for this portion of the um, webinar is to talk a little bit more about some of the, some key findings from the 2020 EPI report. Um, like Sharon mentioned, this report is massive. Um, it's over 200 pages long. It's a couple hundred figures and tables and things. So this presentation is by no means like a comprehensive look at everything that's in the EPI report. It's more of a sampling of the kinds of data that we have in the report. Um, so first, I just want to talk a little bit more about um, the structure of the EPI report. It's got 13 chapters. Um, the first half of the report is more focused on um, specific types of substance use. So we have a chapter on tobacco and vaping, a chapter on alcohol, a chapter on marijuana. Um, these specific target substances that we're particularly concerned about or that are most prevalent. Um, we talk about those specifically. And then the latter portion of the report, we have chapters that are devoted not to specific substances, but chapters that are devoted to special topics and special subgroups. So looking at um, substance exposed infants or looking at gambling. Um, in recent years, we've added chapters on gender and sexuality and on people with disabilities. Um, we've also been trying to focus more on looking at adverse childhood experiences as well as protective factors and positive childhood experiences. So you'll find a lot of different things in this report. Um, and in each chapter, you know, we have our series of you know, charts and tables and, and figures, but we also have some narrative text that helps kind of frame the issues. Um, we try to include things that might involve you know, current policies or practices or recent trends um, with some of these topics um, that can really contextualize the data a little bit better. Um, so just to start off, this is one of our um, charts that we have in the very first chapter where we give kind of a an overview of the state of Delaware um, and, and some of the major substances and, and findings um, as well as just some demographic information about the state of Delaware. Um, so, so here we have um, you know just looking at the major substances that we track um, with our school surveys among eighth and 11th grade students. Um, and the three most prevalent ones that are used are alcohol, marijuana, and, and vaping. Um, and that's common across um, eighth graders and 11th graders. So just kind of gives an overview of um, those most common substances. We also um, combine a few different variables to look at uh, medication that's used in ways other than prescribed. Um, which could include steroids or over-the-counter medication, as well as prescription stimulants or benzos and painkillers. Um, and then we also look at other illegal drugs. Um, and a lot of times when we're looking at other illegal drugs or things that aren't used as commonly, um, we end up aggregating some of them when we're reporting out like this, because otherwise it's a little bit too small of a number to report with statistical accuracy. Um, so that's why you see other illegal drugs, for example, um, combined into one category rather than us individually reporting the percentage of students who might be using cocaine or um, hallucinogens, because sometimes those numbers are just a little bit too small. Um, and we're gonna go to our next slide here. Um, so our second chapter in the report is tobacco and electronic cigarettes. Um, and we've done a lot of focus on vaping in recent years. Um, we also had a publication in the Delaware Journal of Public Health recently, um, I think that was released in August, um, that focused on vaping in Delaware. Um, 
but you know vaping is the activity that is really increasing the most rapidly among young people i'm sure we're all aware of this um, and and this trend chart kind of shows how much um, the percentage of students who report using electronic cigarettes um, vaping devices jewels um, any of those kinds of um, devices how much that prevalence rate has increased just in the last five or six years since we started tracking this data um, so it's pretty alarming because we don't really see increases like this among substances very often um, it's more of past month use among um, 11th grade students has more than quadrupled in the past five years. Um, and, and another thing to note with this is that the way that we've changed, asked, the way that we've asked this question has changed over the years as different devices have come on the market. Um, so you'll see with this, it looks kind of like there was a dip in 2017 that vaping might have gone down, but this was also around the time that Jules became very popular. And we didn't begin asking questions about jewels until the 2018 survey administration. So, so this kind of illustrates too that you know our data isn't always perfect. Um, there are things that we miss or we might ask a question in a way that students aren't thinking about. Um, and we also received a question prior to this um, webinar um, I just wanted to touch on briefly here because somebody asked us um, if we had information about um, what kinds of things that students were vaping. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit of that because we do have a question on the Delaware School Survey that asks students um, when they have used an electronic vaping device, what did you put in it? Um, and this is one where students are allowed to answer the question and mark as many as apply. So students might be vaping multiple things. Um, it's not an exclusive, they're not exclusive categories. Um, but from, from our responses, um, about 21% of students say that they've um, vaped and that when they did, they've used e-liquids, so um, with flavoring, but not with nicotine in it. Um, about 16% of students say that they've vaped and used tobacco or nicotine products in a vape. Um, about 19% of students say that they've used marijuana in a vape. About 5% of students say that they've used synthetic marijuana in a vape. Um, and less than 1% of students are saying that, you know, they used another illegal drug or another substance other than flavoring or nicotine or tobacco or marijuana in a vape. Um, so that gives a little bit of an overview of what's most common um, among students who are vaping, and it's really those flavored e-liquids um, followed by marijuana. Um, and just to highlight from, from alcohol, you know, alcohol is, is alcohol use is still a problem, but when we look at the overall trends and reports of past month alcohol use, both nationally and among students in Delaware, overall they've been declining over the last 20 years with, with a few plateaus and a few dips. Um, but this is overall a positive trend. Um, and with marijuana use, however, um, it's something that's remained relatively stable. Um, so, so while eighth grade use, our data shows that that's declined a little bit, um, among 11th graders, you know, it's gone up and down by a few percentage points over the years, but it's remained relatively stable. And, and marijuana is one of those things that there's a lot of national and state conversation about in terms of medical marijuana and decriminalizing and legalizing the public opinion about this and how safe or not safe it might be to use varies a lot. Um, so this is one where we haven't seen significant um, increases or declines in, in use among students. Um, and we also have um, some chapters, a chapter devoted to opioids, and we talk about prescription misuse as well. Um, and one of the things to highlight here is that um, perception of risk from prescription misuse among students is pretty high. Um, it's, it has some of the highest perceptions of, of great risk among young people. Um, about two thirds of 11th graders say that um, there's a great risk associated with misusing prescription drugs. Um, and when we're talking about prescription misuse, um, we're, we're defining that as using any medication without a doctor's prescription or in a way other than how it was prescribed to you. So that could be taking it more frequently or taking larger doses, even if you do have a prescription. Um, 
and then looking at those overall rates of use, um, we also look at um, national survey on drug use and health data, which surveys adult population. Um, and, and you know, we show from our surveys that about 3% of 8th and 11th grade students are reporting misusing prescription painkillers. Um, and the National Survey on Drug Use Health and Health data um, you know, supports that you know, it's around 3% of young people have misused these drugs. Um, and that the age group with the highest prevalence of misuse is the 18 to 25 year old range. And then older than that, it kind of drops off again a little bit. Um, we also have a chapter on data relating to substance exposed infants and something that we wanted to highlight here um, is looking at the data that we have on the mothers that are involved in those cases. Um, you know, we focus a lot on, on the infants and that's very important. Um, but when we look at the mothers too, in many cases, um, these mothers have been exposed or have a history with DFS themselves as children or have had childhood trauma or have co-occurring mental health conditions. Um, so these are important things to, to highlight, you know, 40% in 2019, 40% of the mothers who were involved in cases with substance exposed infants had involvement with DFS themselves as children. Um, so, you know, there's some intergenerational trauma that happens when we're looking at these cases. Um, Gambling, just to highlight one data point here, um, that's important, you know, that um, among students who gambled, uh, reported gambling in the past year, which is, um, we define it as a, a variety of things, um, you know, playing online games for money or playing lottery or scratch off tickets um, or betting on sports games and things like that. But there's a positive association between um, past month substance use and between gambling. So the students who report that they've gambled are also reporting using substances at higher rates than students who have not gambled. Um, and, and something that you know we've been talking a lot about, you know, always, but this year in particular with with COVID, um, you know, paying attention to these mental health indicators. Um, this will be something really important to continue to watch in future years um, as we as we gather data, especially with how unprecedentedly stressful this year has been um, is trends in some of these mental health indicators. Um, so we asked students um, if in the past year they've had feelings of sadness or hopelessness nearly every day for a two week period of, or longer. Um, and this is an indicator that a student might be experiencing depression. Um, and, and it was mostly steady for a while, but in the last couple of years in our administrations, this figure has been ticking up just a little bit. And it's something that we would anticipate might be continuing to increase, especially after the, the crises of this year. Um, like I mentioned, we've been trying to do more work highlighting people with disabilities in a lot of the SCOW work. Um, so we've added a chapter on disabilities. We added this chapter actually to last year's report and we're continuing to highlight that work. Um, and something you know, pretty serious to look at with these populations is that you know, students with one or more disabilities um, are also reporting um, some, some pretty severe um, negative mental health indicators as well. Um, so 54% of students with disabilities say that they were sad or hopeless for nearly every day for two weeks compared to only 17% of students without disabilities. Um, if we look at something like planning suicide, you know, five times the rate of students with disabilities are reporting that they planned a suicide in the past year compared to students without disabilities. So these are pretty stark disparities. Um, we also look at adverse childhood experiences, um, or ACEs, as most of us know them. Um, so when we look at, you know, the, the breakdown of ACEs among high school students, almost half of the students in our, in our survey have experienced one or more ACEs. Um, about 21% say they've experienced one ACE, and 23% say they've experienced two or more ACEs. Um, and then when we look at how that experience of having um, ACEs also intersects with um, substance use behavior, or risk behaviors, we see that you know, the students that report having more experience of trauma tend to also report um, higher rates of other risky behavior like substance use. Um, and this is pretty clearly across 
most of the, all of the substances that we're, we're measuring. Um, the more students with two or more experiences of trauma, um, based on how the questions that we're asking and defining as trauma um, are pretty much across the board using substances at more than twice the rate of students who don't have those experiences of trauma. Um, gender and sexuality. So we have a few questions on the um, YRBS survey now asking students about their sexual orientation and also asking about their gender, specifically if they're transgender. Um, and, and when we look at this, and when we look at those students that are um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, or questioning, and those students who um, are transgender questioning those, their gender, um, one of the things that we see is that those students also report um, experiences of bullying, experiences of not feeling safe at higher rates than their cisgender and heterosexual peers. Um, so when we think about how certain populations or subgroups of students are often considered vulnerable or at risk. Um, these are the kind of things that we mean that might put them at risk. Um, it's those experiences of, of violence and victimization and not feeling safe. Um, and then our, our final chapter in the FB report, I've just got two slides here to, to talk about. Um, you know, we, we also want to highlight some of those protective factors, those positive experiences, or those things that we can help to build up resilience. Um, and um, one of the questions that we ask students is, what, what are your sources of support and encouragement? Who do you go to that gives you support? And 73% of high school students say that they go to their parents. 61% um, said that they had friends that gave them a lot of um, support and experience support and encouragement. Um, and a lot of students also had other people in their life that they went to. Um, there were still 7% of students who said they had no one who provided them with support and encouragement. Um, so that's, a, that's a, a window for some intervention there. There are students who still don't feel like they have a space where they can get support and encouragement. Um, and then we also include some data from the National Survey of Children's Health. Um, and we include this data in our ACEs chapter and our Protective Factors chapter. Um, and, and this specifically looks at um, family resilience. So do how many children live in homes where the family has qualities of, of resilience, where they talk together about what they do about things, when they work together to solve problems, um, they feel like they're staying hopeful in difficult times, and that they have strengths to draw upon. Um, and a little more than 80% of um, the family, the children surveyed in this survey come from families that have um, those, those indicators of family resilience. Um, there's still about 20% that don't necessarily display all of those indicators or any of them, but there are a lot of kids from families that do. Um, and that's important to not just having someone that you can go to that provides you support and, and support and encouragement, but also having a family dynamic that upholds those things as well. Um, and then just a, a final thing to kind of highlight, you know, all of the data in the 2020 report came from 2019 or earlier. So this is all pre-pandemic data that we're working with. Um, and yeah, most of our school surveys, we kind of analyze and report the data from that survey in the following year because of the timing of how it takes to process everything. And most larger federal data sources are one to two years behind when they were collected to when they were reported. Um, so, so we know that you know, the pandemic has had a lot of really dire effects on people's um, you know, economic well-being, their mental health. Um, there's a looming eviction crisis and we know that housing insecurity is one of those um one of those things that really drives so much um you know and unemployment and just the social isolation social isolation of um, not being able to go to school not being able to go out and do things um especially when you think about people who might be in unsafe homes to begin with and going out might be their only place where they get support um, so so the pandemic and the conditions of the pandemic are heightening all these things. Um, and there's you know, preliminary data that suggests that people are drinking more during the pandemic, that people are, their mental health is suffering, depression, anxiety is on the rise. Um, so there's all these really important things for us to keep in mind um, and that we really want to be able to capture and measure in our data. 
And at the same time, um, a lot of our data collection has been a lot more limited in the pandemic because we can't necessarily go in person and do things or we can't necessarily go into a school right now and give a survey. Um, so, so all this to say that, you know, in the next year or so, it'll be really important to try and measure these things in data. Um, and in the next year or so, we might not be able to report everything that we've reported this year because we might not have access to the same data because the pandemic limited some things. Um, and I know we got some questions in the chat. Um, so I think at this point, we'll look and see if anything was put in the chat that we can um, answer questions about. Um, and then if anybody has questions currently, now that we're done with the presentation or wants to share any insights they have on how they've seen some of this data in their own work, um, now would be a great time to um, do that. And I believe folks now are able to unmute themselves if they want to ask a question. Thank you, Rachel, um, for presenting such a, a very um, sweeping overview in a very short period of time. That's just, just the tip of the iceberg that, uh, of, of the information contained in the report. I know one question that came in um, was from Bill Lynch, and it was regarding whether or not we ask if anyone is um, vaping alcohol, and I don't believe we ask that as, a, as an option. Uh, no, we don't. We ask, um, we ask if they've used specifically um, tobacco or nicotine, marijuana or synthetic marijuana. And then we have two options that are kind of like other options. Um, so we have one that's other illegal drugs. And then we have another one that's just an unspecified other. So if a student is vaping something that they wouldn't consider in those other categories. So I would think that if a student is vaping alcohol, it would be in that other category, but we don't specifically capture if it's alcohol or, or what it might be. So now that um, folks have heard a little bit about different categories of um, the different topics that we cover in it, we'd love to know what your thoughts are, or if you'd like to share a little bit about what your data needs are, or um, if you'd like to share a little bit about how you've used information from either the epi report or some of the other resources that we produced i'd be glad to chime in a little bit first of all i uh, really appreciate this report in a lot of different ways um peggy geiser from the sussex county health coalition that's the hat i'm wearing today and uh, i use this when we go to apply for a lot of grants um, and i also use it from some of our uh for our partners to think about planning collectively on what type of prevention messaging and services that we need to do in our community. And I think it's very helpful. One of the things that I would really like to see um, as we're very interested in trends for health and thinking about the vaping and it's, uh, it's becoming more pr prominent, I would really wanna know, is there a way to cross-reference any of this with some of the community health needs assessment data or any of the, um, the DIN data? to find out if more kids are going in to see their pediatricians or their, their family uh, around uh, any type of upper respiratory issues um, or things that might be contributing to their health um, in some way. Um, are we seeing any, you know, any asthmatic issue? I mean, I don't know what the, the, you know, the other thing is, is that when they vape, unlike with a cigarette, which has a certain amount of nicotine in it, they're able to put higher levels of quantity. So are we starting to see more anxiety? Are we start, is there anything that this is contributing to ancillary um, that we could look at maybe not cause and effect, but at least a correlation around health outcomes for kids in our community and our teens, specifically in the high school. And I would think we could maybe tie in with the, uh, the wellness centers as the first uh, uh, place to gather some of that information, but then secondarily um, from a state perspective. So just a, a question that might help us. Thank you for that, Peggy. And thank you. You are one of the true data champions. You always are seeking data and pushing it out there. And we're very happy to be working with the coalition. Um, appreciate that. It's a great question. If a, if a data element if, if, for example, there's a vaping question and an asthma question in the same survey, 
we could look to see if there are correlations, perhaps. We wouldn't be able to talk cause and effect, of course. But when we're talking about crossing data sources, I think the best thing that we could do is look at trends that seem to be emerging along one line and look at the other data source to see if there are trends that are emerging along the other line. Um, one thing I always like to say when we're looking at the quantitative data sets is that these give us a lot of information on the surface, but don't often give us the deep dive of to the whys things are happening. So we look at these data sources to get, um, you know, like to look for what I like to think of as hot spots, where we would then want to dive deeper, probably with some qualitative measures. But you raise a really good point, and we can certainly uh, look at those individual surveys and see. Off the top of my head, I want to say that the national um, the National Survey of Children's Health, I believe, asks questions about uh, different kinds of health conditions. That's actually a survey that's conducted with parents about their children's health. So there, I know that they have mental health indicators that they ask about in there. They also have physical health questions that they ask. So that might be a really good source to look at if you're looking to see if there's a, a relationship. I can't swear that those questions are both asked in there, but that would be the first place that I would check out. Um, I, I would also mention that in addition to having these reports and products put up, folks can come to us with specific questions like that. And if we don't collect the data, we try to connect you with a resource that would be the best place to go to, to start to look. Is that helpful at all? So, um, yeah, but it also has got me thinking then that maybe I use your data as a launching point. So like I could go to a mayor health care or, you know, or, um, you know, high mark blue cross and blue shield. And I could say, can you give me indication, any indication in my catchment area, if there's an increase in the number of visits for this group, um, around anything that has to do that might contribute to it from a vaping you know, if they can give me even within their catchment something that would marry up to your trends, then that gives me some ideas around, you know, what type of strategies, and I might even be able to bring them into helping me in, in, in doing those strategies out in the community. So it's just ways I'm thinking about that and how we can use other this to actually launch into getting a deeper discussion around some of the other health outcomes, right? That sounds great. Let us know if I think you another... Go ahead, Sorry, Sharon. Peggy, I was going to say another potential avenue could be My Healthy Community, that the dashboard via DPH. They do have some asthma indicators on there. I, I, we can play around with it and see, but that could also be like a group conversation too between the SCOW um, and DPH as well to maybe try to kind of, um, I guess, like massage some of some of the connection between between what you're seeing in your community. I don't know if it'll be able to get down to that level, but that could be an avenue as well to at least pursue. Thanks, Laura. Hi. Hello. Hey. Hi, uh, my name is Haja and I'm a, I'm a graduate student at the University of Delaware with Health uh, Partnership Health Community. I don't know if you talk about this, but was it like a particular community in Delaware or a group of people that had like higher rate of like VIPN compared to like other population group or population or group? Yeah, so the, the data that we have in house on vaping is um, data from, it's all youth data. So it's data um, surveys that are, you know, into a, a random sample of schools, public schools around the state of Delaware. Um, and looking at, um, you're thinking like demographically of among those student populations. Um, I don't think there was one that um, really stood out a whole lot as having like more more extreme vaping um, compared to the others. Um, I mean, by I think by age, there's there's definitely some some increases there as the students get older. More of them are using. Um, I would have to look back. We do have this data in the chapter. Um, I think there were small um, small differences by by gender. Um, among vaping, um, but I don't think there were significant differences by the race or ethnicity measures that we that we track in the surveys. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, to her point, and I think that was a great question, is there any population that was underrepresented? 
So when you look across those demographics, was there a percentage that were underrepresented that might have skewed that? Um, so, so one of the one of the you know caveats or problems with survey data is that there's always going to be groups that are underrepresented. Um, you know, so so with these um, you know school surveys, it's kind of like a a captive population. So you get the all the kids that are in school, but that being said, you only get the kids who are in school. Um, you know, so for example, students who are maybe experiencing homelessness or housing insecurity might not be in school. Um, you know, students who are having, you know, severe mental health or um, trauma issues or who are maybe doing the worst on a lot of these indicators are probably the students who are least likely to be in school. Um, so, so all of this data, um, you know, you have to assume to a small extent that it's undercounting a lot of these, these phenomenon because we're capturing the kids who are in school and the kids who are answering these survey questions honestly. And there's always going to be some degree of, you know, the students who are maybe doing the worst aren't in school. Um, so I think when we're thinking about who we're not capturing, that's a big part of that. Um, we know that a lot of data too, um, you yeah, know, and this is why we've tried to highlight a little bit more LGBTQ students and students with disability, because we know that these are two populations in particular that are often kind of invisible in data collection. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question a little bit. Yeah, this is Leslie. I would just like to build on that question a little bit and, and ask about, um, you know, black and brown communities where we know there's so much uh, disparity. It, was there any oversampling done for any of these uh, measures in those communities? Um, not with the school surveys. I, I don't know if, um, with because we do draw from other data sources as well to include in, in the EPI report. Um, and I don't know, I can't speak to the methodology of like those external sources, what some of them may do or not do. Um, but with the school surveys, it is just who is in the schools that, that we're sampling. Um, and I'm not totally sure about um, how those schools are, are selected or what, um, what those population parameters are. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. In terms of the Delaware School Survey and the, um, uh, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, the Delaware School Survey is a, and, and um, thank you, Deb Berkey, for asking your question about what percentage of kids are um, the population of students that are being sampled. Um, actually, uh, we do have data in terms of, in the report, we talk about the number of kids that were sampled for each survey. I will have to go back and look up to see what the percentages of the kids who are in the, the Delaware public school system. But the uh, Delaware school survey is actually a census of the fifth, eighth, and 11th graders in public schools in Delaware. The mm -hmm. YPS is a census of schools currently, this could change, a census of schools, uh, public schools, but within that a sample that is drawn by the CDC of classes in there. So I'm going to need to um, do a little research and get back to you on that percentage. We can make the question and answers um, that we're not able to address today available to you all as well as a follow-up to this. So that's really good discussion and, and what are your recommendations Sharon? Because we have an underrepresentation of schools in Sussex County that we can draw data on. Um, first of all, schools won't share those with us because it's proprietary. They don't want anybody to know their kids are using drugs and alcohol in Southern Delaware. Um, that's my soapbox. Secondly, um, the fact is that um, it really is difficult for a community to plan when most of our kids are not responding. And how do we better advocate for that? Is there something the community can do to advocate for it? Because we know that the state has a limited ability uh, to put pressure there, schools will just say, you can't do it. And I know this year is probably dead in the water, but thinking about the future, is there a way for us from a community perspective to get better quality data teed up for you guys so that we would be able to do appropriate level planning in the future? Um, I would, uh, yes, absolutely. The answer to that is, uh, I think that uh, and I'm really going to encourage um, any of our folks that are on the survey team. I used to work on the survey team. 
um, so I do know history on this, but anybody that's from the center that's, that's able to chime in, I really would welcome that as well. But you're right, Peggy, there's been a downward trajectory of participation, um, not only in Southern Delaware, but also throughout the state. This is a trend that our colleagues in other states are seeing as well. Part of that is because the schools themselves are challenged to be able to cover the waterfront and everything that they need to present curricularly and in other programs, as well as being able to free up the time. It's, it's one class period for these surveys. We try very hard not to sample the same um, kids twice in one year. If, if we're doing the YRBS or the YTS that year, we try to not give them the Delaware School Survey. Uh, we work to make it as convenient as possible to go into the schools. But in addition to that element, there is some resistance in the part of um, some districts to allow folks to come in and do the surveys because they get pressure from the parent groups. So one of the things that we've worked on consistently at the center, but increasingly, is that developing that relationship with the schools, continuing to uh, stress and promote the use of the data and show what it's used for. I think groups like yours are very important in having a voice in that and being able to show where there's a data desert, um, to show where, you know, like the data has been useful in obtaining funding. Um, the significance of that is really important. And the groups that are in the community have a lot more weight, I think, than folks in our research center trying to, to make that argument. So definitely, uh, I think that these are the kinds of things you can look at. The heat maps are actually quite nice in that regard because they actually show where we have data, where we don't have data, but they show where the hotspots are as well. So those are my thoughts. I don't know if anybody else on the team or anybody else in the, in the network would like to chime in, but um, we're always looking for ways to increase that engagement. And that is one of the strengths, I think, of the SEOW, that it can, it can rally folks from different parts of the state to do that. Um, well, maybe if judiciously the school districts, um, if there was a funding mechanism that the number of kids that actually complete the survey more prevention dollars went into their schools, they would be more likely to be inclined to advocate to their parents why it's important. Um, because, you know, no data, no dollars kind of a concept. Uh, so, you know, that's a strategy that I think others have deployed. Um, in the past that it be a reinforcing initiative instead of a punishing um, yeah. initiative. Um, so it's just, uh, you know, I think there's a way to advocate for that and to think about that. I know right now might not be the best time to talk about it given <laughs> where we're gonna be financially as a state, but I think as a strategy in the future, it's worth a dialogue um, around that. And I, and, um... And I would say that that's a really good idea and um, that that would probably be very helpful for you to, to work with the survey team on that in terms of advocacy around that. Another thing that has been presented to us is that other states actually require legally, um, it's a legal mandate to participate in the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. That hasn't been the case in Delaware, but we can look to other states as models for how they um, how that happened and, and whether or not that's something that would be important um, to yes. consider. So that's a yes, because we need to know who advocated for that in those states and figure out who in our state are the right advocates for that. Um, you know, nationally, our children are gonna be left behind as there's a growing rate of kids that are getting addicted. And all of the problems we're dealing with with adults started when they were 12. I mean, most kids, when we did our assessment with talking to a group was age 12. I mean, you can see the jump between on all your data from fifth grade to 11th grade, double and triple the numbers. We don't have a unified prevention system. We're not targeting it. We're not putting enough money into it. And we're not going to if we don't measure it because we can't put our hands around it. And so that gives the politicians the ability to skirt the issue. And so in my mind, that needs to be changed. So Sharon, it's Bill Lynch. Hi, Bill. How are you? Great. I got lots of points. But with regards to the last one, we've actually taken some initiatives in New Jersey and wanted to share the positive ones that worked. Okay. So one of those ways is that I know on the heat maps, you guys will leave white areas are the ones that did not participate. 
Mm -hmm. I think you should be a little bolder and put DNP in those zip codes. Did not participate, did not participate, did not participate. So it's clear which school districts are not doing it. But the other way that we did it in New Jersey with regards to a number of initiatives, law enforcement carrying naloxone, uh, uh, school nurses having naloxone in their schools, having to take back boxes at the police departments. We went on record as thanking the ones that did do it. So in your report, bold and, and significant, thank the school districts that did participate in your survey because that mobilizes the parents who see it and say, where's my school district? So the ones who are gonna complain you're sampling our kids, you're gonna have that offset by the ones who are calling saying, how come our school district didn't participate in the University of Delaware survey so we can find out what is going on and know what to address and how. But the way to do that is you shame the non-participants by thanking the participants. And that has worked pretty well for us with initiatives that we've done uh, in New Jersey. Thank the ones who participate, often, early and often, as much as you can. And then the ones who don't, it's pretty obvious on your heat map when they're white and it says DNP, DNP, who's not participating. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Do you see a question that's come in about whether librarians in Delaware are now learning about naloxone? I don't know if anybody, I don't, I don't have the answer to that. Does anybody uh, in the discussion room have any information about that? Um, I don't know about that in Delaware. Oh, sorry, Peggy. So no, um, I know that they've taken a greater role in navigation and training and support, and they're starting on telehealth, telemedicine. Um, they're actually going in that. So they're really looking holistically. Now, whether they themselves have been trained, I do not believe so. Um, I can always check with Annie Norman and find out and be glad to get back to you on that. Um, and if on here with me, she can make sure that that happens so I don't drop the ball. But I think they would be open. Um, I mean, when they are completely open, they're just partially open right now, right? But I think they would be open to this. They are taking as uh, looking at a collective impact model from a statewide perspective on how they can be more integral in helping be a safe place for, uh, for people to go and be and get information. And Loxone is part of that, right? So, you know, I just think it, it, we need to just have a judicious conversation with Annie about that desire and, um, and I, and I believe it could be pushed out. I mean, if anybody wants to use um, her network, I mean, she's all in, so. Thank you. And, I, and MJ, I see that you've said, um, yes, they are. Um, I'm not sure if that's in, to the trauma-informed part of their efforts or if that's to the naloxone part of their efforts. If you know that they're being trained in naloxone, could you just sign that into the chat or just chime in? Um, but yeah. I, yes, good afternoon. Uh, that was a uh, reflection of Trauma Informed. DCM has worked with um, the libraries around youth mental health first aid, being trauma informed. Um, naloxone trainings are obviously promoted in community settings, libraries being one of them. I'm not aware of a specific initiative to train librarians on naloxone, um, but that might be an interesting direction to take it. One thing I do want to say is, uh, again, kudos to uh, Sharon and Rachel for doing a phenomenal job. In response to, and we only have a couple more minutes, but in response to using the data and getting the data out there, I think one way that we can do that is for our partners to be transparent in their use of the data, right? Because then if it's not your partner saying, I'm using the data, then it just seems like MJ and Sharon are asking nosy questions, right? Here goes CDAS asking those awfully uncomfortable questions. So when our partners are using data to bring funding into their centers, into their after school programs, um, to inform teen pregnancy prevention, because we focus a lot on, on primary uh, substance use prevention, but this data is used in a lot of different ways with a lot of different stakeholders and partners. And so for them to be transparent, I think builds a level of comfort with the school surveys and also invites people to see this kind of the the ownership of their data and, and how important that is so i think that's a role for our partners to kind of assist us with so that we can continue to assist them so again great job sharon and rachel thank you mj for the information and for the kind words of support 
Um, I, I do think, I, I, see, um, I, I see Leslie's comment in the chat about offering webinars videos and the like, and I think that those are good ideas. Um, we've, we have tried that. I think the driver of that to make those truly successful is when we have folks that are um, actually advocates from the parent groups or from the schools themselves that want to spearhead that, I think we get a lot more traction from that. So that's where that collaborative element comes in. And um, I'm always looking forward to working with the actual folks in those particular community settings. They may wear other hats, they may be at the state level, or they may be um, working on coalitions or what have you, but I think that that's as well. So we do have a couple more minutes here for folks who would like to um, have any last minute questions or comments. Um, I do want to remind everyone that the materials that we talk about today are all online and can be downloaded. But if you're not finding the answer to your questions, um, we would want you to be able to uh, reach out to us. Um, slides will have our, have our email addresses on it for any follow up. Um, you can certainly come to the website and, and, and find us there as well. And uh, any last minute thoughts um, that anyone would like to share before we ask you to take a short poll? Sharon, I got a number of quick points. Uh, one is vaping other substances via device alcohol. We actually are seeing youth coming in intoxicated with vaping because either alcohol's in the diluent and they don't even know that, or they purposefully vape uh, alcohol. One of those is that I jokingly in my presentation will say this time of year, it's the most wonderful time of the year. And the reason I bring that up is how many of us are making cookies and are you using vanilla extract? Because vanilla extract is actually 70 proof so we have people that actually come in and they will actually vape vanilla extract and they actually are intoxicated. One of the ones I was wondering about, uh, would you consider putting in something about naloxone and asking students and young adults, have, do they have it? Have they used it? Do they have it in their home? And are they trained? And the reason being is 55% of overdoses occur in the home. And we're trying an initiative, they just announced in Delaware, about being able to have it mailed to your house and with this naloxone initiative in Delaware. So that may be of some benefit. I was also curious if you could follow the trends of marijuana, especially in Delaware and Newcastle County, because New Jersey approved in the last election recreational marijuana and the influence of that being trafficked down here, up to including the, the uh, Attorney General of New Jersey has already requested decreased prosecutions of those with marijuana. So there's going to be an influx just from that alone. Uh, thank you for the shout out. I look forward to the reports and tables and graphs as slides. I always use those. I like that very much with regards to that. Also, I'm curious with regards to youth being asked, have they ever used an unknown or unmarked substance? We're having an issue with this in South Jersey, unmarked heroin bags, which are actually all different kinds of fentanyl analogs. And we have a higher overdose with those than we do, and also fatalities than those that are state. And even just an unknown pill or those kind of things, because I think that the risk behavior. One of those suggestions is you actually had tracing and tracking your ACEs and you do zero and then two or more. But my understanding is as ACEs increase two to three, three to four, five to six or whatever, that the increase in detriment of those effects is geometric, not just arithmetic. So one of the ones that I remember is a national presentation where they showed if they had four to six ACEs, 76% of those individuals went on to injection drug use. That's a huge statement. And the reason I think that because you can look at interventions now when you see those to really know you have to intervene with those kind of things. In the protective Slide, I was wondering if you guys are tracking uh, use affiliation with faith-based faith organizations, because I didn't see that in the slide, so I was curious about the impact of that. Is it positive with regards to that? And the other thing I want to share at the end here is that uh, we've already done a presentation way back in May about the impact of COVID on mental health and substance use disorder, and uh, it's significant. We see it dramatically at the hospital. Alcoholism is through the roof. But the one thing I want to make sure people knew is that Stanford has shown that vaping and smoking increases your risk to contract COVID and have a worse outcome. So much so that Stanford went on record to say that vaping or using cigarettes should be considered a risk factor for COVID, just like diabetes, cardiovascular disease and the like. So that was actually pretty interesting data that was out there. So if you need more of information in a not so fast way, I can share that with you later. But I just want to go over those because I took notes during the presentation because I always love 
uh, the day that you guys present and thank your whole team for it. Um, I love Jim Heiberg. I don't see him on here's heat maps. He started those. So uh, they're ones I use a lot. And people really zoom in on those because when I say my zip code is 19810, what's your zip code? And people hone right in on that. And I think that that's good for one, if the data is there. And also, again, it reiterate if they didn't participate, well, why there's no data for my zip code? Well, your school district didn't participate in that. That's why there's no data there. So, but thank you again, as always, and have a nice holiday season, everybody. Thank you, Bill. We appreciate your support. And I'll pass those questions on to the survey folks that are that are designing the surveys. Um, I'm gonna just ask Rachel to advance to the last slide mm -hmm. on the call. Um, we have a brief poll that we're gonna launch and it's a little bit of a satisfactory survey, so you could do that while we're wrapping up. Um, we are very happy that you all joined us today. Um, we hope to have more of these discussions. Um, we look forward to getting any recommendations you might have for other topics to discuss. So please feel free to reach out at any point. And I did also wanna mention that um, we have an upcoming SEOW semi-annual meeting coming up at, on the 28th of January. If you haven't received information on this, please let me know and I'll be happy to send out the registration link to you. Uh, we'll be putting out the agenda in early January, but we are going to be talking about uh, ACEs in more detail. We're gonna have Dr. Khalil Husseini talk about that. And we're going to also um, share some additional resources from the SEOW. So take a minute if you can, and thank you for, for your uh, involvement today. We know it's a busy time of year. We know it's been a crazy year. And we really, truly appreciate your support and involvement in the SEOW. So thank you for that. And Rachel, thank you for um, giving us such an analysis of this. Thank you for organizing it. It was very informative and I learned a lot and great work. Thank you, Haja. It's nice to see you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for attending. Thanks, yeah. On the 28th, I think, too. Um, Rachel, did we launch that poll? That's actually just going to ask. I was wondering where it is. Yeah, I, I you thought you, you were launching it, and then I realized you had it. So here it yeah, is. I, I, I thought that was what we agreed on, Sharon. <laughs> but that was an hour ago, you know. <laughs> it's okay. We have it now. Um, and um, Bill, to answer just a couple of your questions while we're doing the poll. Um, you know, in term, we do have, um, we asked one of our questions on the Delaware School Survey, um, when we asked students about sources of, of support, um, one of the response categories on that survey is um, adults from your faith community or a faith-based leader. So we do track that a little bit on one of our other surveys. It's not on both the DSS and YRBS as an option. Um, and then when looking at the, the ACEs, um, you know, and how we disaggregate it by zero ACEs or one ACE or two or more, um, in our particular data, the, the numbers get too small when we start looking individually at three or four or five or six to um, really do a whole, lot, a whole lot more with that in a way that's statistically robust. Um, so that's part of why we, we kind of cap it at two or more, um, but if we had a larger sample or something like that, um, you know, I agree that looking at that in more, with more specificity um, would probably show a much steeper um, level of disparity because that's what other data sources tend to show. I just wanted to address those couple of things real quick since I could answer them. Thank you, Rachel, appreciate the update. Yeah, yeah, they're great questions. <laughs>